It definitely works. Okay, now I'm afraid. Adding more gasoline won't guarantee a bigger blast. You watch yourself there, hombre. The critical mix needs more air. That's, oh, that's probably it. That's probably all that it takes. Do you think there's anything left of a fume in there? Go, go, go. Okay, here I go. Let's talk more sparks. Stop your grinning and grab your linen. Here we go. was right. We now know exactly what kind of concentration of fuel that we have to have for ignition. We know that we can create a spark from static electricity off of fabric, and uh, we know that it is something that we have to be very careful with. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. Am I missing an eyebrow? <laughs> <laughs> I am missing an eyebrow, aren't I? Yeah, you lost a lot of air up there. You're kidding me. No. You're all right. It's not gonna, it won't look weird after a day or two. <laughs> I think it took him about five seconds to worry about whether he's going to look funny for his date. I have a date tomorrow. Is it survival more important or sex? <laughs> Crawl in the name of science. Okay, that was probably one of the stupidest things I've ever done. No problem now with the static spark. The mix is right, and ignition comes easily. But what about the cell phone? Will it prove to be the cause of gas station fires? Nada. Niente. Second call. No explosion. So, Bob, have you heard of this myth regarding uh, exploding a gas station by using a cell phone? Uh, not only did I hear, but I'm quoted in the myth that says, Mr. Rinkus says, don't use cell phones. They can cause fire at the pump. Uh, that email's gone around and people take that literally because they are believing everything they see in emails, unfortunately. <laughs> After researching hundreds of gas station fires, Bob Rankes of the Petroleum Equipment Institute says cell phones are in the clear. Pure and simple, we don't have any accidents involving a cell phone at a service station. It just doesn't happen. But a dramatic fire department demonstration clearly shows what can happen when static is involved. People who re-enter the car during refueling face the biggest risk. They're typically younger people, because older people will go like this to get out of their car. And when they do that, they discharge. So they just simply pop out of the car, not touch anything, not shut the door, not ground themselves, not touch this. They'll take one two steps, they're wearing neoprene shoes, so they're not discharging, they're not dissipating on the concrete. They touch a piece of metal here, the vapors are coming out of the tank, the air is coming in from outside, so that's two parts of the fire triangle, and the third part is a source of ignition, which is the spark. The problem comes is when they overreact, they go, oh my goodness, and they leave a stream of gasoline, they already have a fire, it gets underneath the car, or they could get it on themselves. With the cell phone myth well and truly busted, they still want to make their own big static bag. So they're back at Fred Stokes Gasoline Museum with the fire department there to monitor safety. You're going to pump the whole thing in there. It's make or break time. So today the guys are using a much higher concentration of gas in a much finer spray. Okay, that's it. All right, here we go. Watching for spark. Despite a heavy saturation of gasoline vapors, still no blast. This is a pain in the butt. You know, we got the darn thing so it's foggy with gas fumes in there, and no boom. What are you going to do? Lighten jar, I am finished with you. Desperate to get their big bang, the boys decide to use extra juice. Good spark. That good? Yeah. We're using a, a spark that's actually a smaller spark in terms of the kilovolts, but it's longer. We're using neon transformer to generate it, but it lasts as long as we want. So I feel totally confident we're gonna get the concussive boom that we want right now. Okay, Adam, let's get ready. Come on, okay, here we go. Stand by. I feel like something's gonna happen this time. In three, two, one. <laughs> wow, 
Wow, I forgot to watch. That was really cool. <laughs> right on. Whew. Hey, we got it. Yeah. That was a lot of force. Yes, it was. That burst apart this 24-foot seam of uh, metal tape. Well, it's about time, huh? It's about time. Absolutely right. Don't be fooled. Gasoline vapors and a strong spark under the right conditions spell danger at the fuel pump. Bob, what is your recommendation if there is a spark, if there is ignition, what should you do? If you discharge here and you get a spark, don't be a hero. Don't take your nozzle out. Your gas tank will contain the gasoline. We don't want any gasoline spilling on the forecourt or on the pavement. Stand away and notify the station immediately. Adam, what do you reckon? Myth busted? Absolutely. This myth is definitely busted. No cell phone will ever cause a gas station to ignite. Just not going to happen. I agree. Next, will oh. silicon implants bust under pressure? We take them to 30,000 feet to find out. You probably pass away in about 10 minutes. Remember, don't try this at home. We're what you call experts. Jamie. Yo. I got breaths. Check this out. There's a myth that when you go up on an airplane, the reduction in pressure will explode your implants. The basic story is that there's a woman with silicone implants on an airplane, and there's a depressurized cabin because it's a local flight, perhaps from LA to San Francisco. And as the plane goes higher, the implants get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until finally they explode as she's walking down the aisle to the lavatory to see what's going on with her implants. There we go. Oh, sample not for implant. One size fits all. There's not like a bigger or a smaller one. So we've got the implants, right? What else are we going to need for this, Jamie? We've got to have a chamber that will handle both pressure and, you know, vacuum. So positive and negative pressure. Yeah. And we've got to have a vacuum pump, a pressure pump, and um, to make it look good, um, you know, put the implants in a body of some sort. Maybe well, a... The ballistics gelatin would be perfect for that. We could make up a torso out of the ballistics gelatin and put the implants in. It would be very close to skin, so we could probably see, you yeah. know, if there was any real movement. And the gel is clear, so we can see what's going on. Yeah. When you do it for cosmetic purposes, probably over 100,000 patients a year have breast augmentation. For that group, plastic surgeon Dr. Gregory George knows his implants. He's performed thousands of procedures over 25 years. I have heard the myth. And you'd be not infrequently asked by patients, you know, who had active lifestyles if they were going to skin dive, what would happen in their implants, or what would happen in uh, decompression in an airplane. And that was a common question. Have you ever heard any fantastic stories about this actually occurring? No, I never really have heard any fantastic uh, stories. I had no first-hand experience with a patient that uh, had a, quote, blowout at altitude uh, along the way. But lots of people were worried about it, shall we say. Adam and Jamie are back in familiar territory, surrounded by scrap metal and high-tech surplus. I love this place. I spend every Saturday that I get a chance down here. They have coffee and donuts. Cryo containers. Beer kegs. What else we got? They're looking for a tank to convert to a chamber. They want to reproduce the altitude pressures that may cause an implant to expand or explode. Looks like the world's most expensive garbage can. <laughs> yeah. Now there's a tank. Unfortunately, it feels like it's maybe 2,000 pounds or so. I see one back here that's yeah. starting to look like. <laughs> oh my lord! You have to come here and look at this. By the looks of this, this is, you know, not ultra high pressure, but it's pretty good. Look at the thickness on those. I love it when I find this kind of stuff. I mean, this is so cool. This is like sci-fi right here. Probably cost somebody maybe 30 or 50 grand new. I don't know. But it's just a beautiful piece of hardware. I, got, I, I get such a kick out of this stuff. So, I'm gonna try and implant these in a fake woman. 
The first step towards exploding the implant myth is to modify a store dummy. A heat vacuum appliance is used to make a plastic mold of the torso that will hold the implants. Always looking to match reality, Adam will suspend the implants in the ballistics gel. Now it's just a matter of putting the implants into place. The silicone is actually a little bit lighter in density than the water, but I push them down in and hopefully suction will keep them at the bottom. They're looking pretty good right now. I'm going to wash my hands and check in in 20 minutes. Hmm. The important job is to make the chamber as airtight as possible. Some portholes are welded shut, while others are replaced. And finally, an air pressure gauge is fitted. Adam's gelatin torso has set. The implants are holding. Go. Look at that. It's a thing of beauty. My God, I've done it! <laughs> All right. As a parallel experiment, Jamie places an implant in a jug of water. Any changes should be easy to see. If we find that the implant is actually expanding, the water level will raise, and we can measure that. Adam calibrates an easy-to-read altitude guide for the gauge. The chamber is sealed. So are we ready to go? For the first test, the implants are subjected to typical in-flight cabin pressure, which for passenger comfort is equivalent to around 8,000 feet above sea level. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what I see is, uh, is the bubbles that were on the surface of the implant have gotten larger, mm -hmm. and it's maybe raised the water level a minuscule amount as a result of that. Right. But uh, I, I don't see any expansion of the breast itself. Mm -hmm. All right, shall we take it up to, uh, let's say, 30,000 feet? The big test comes as the chamber matches an altitude of around 30,000 feet. An impossible height for humans, unless flying in a pressurized cabin. I mean, it doesn't look like much, but if I were in there with the breast implants, I'd probably be dead about now. Your lungs would fill with fluid, your head would, you know, compress. It's just a whole bunch of conditions. None of them are pretty. It, you'd probably pass away in about 10 minutes at that height. Despite the negative pressure of high flying, the implants appear unchanged. We've seen the implants at about 8,000 feet. Then we bumped it up to around 35,000 feet or so. And uh, in both cases, we've seen expansion of little air bubbles around the things uh, to some degree. But uh, the implants themselves have shown no significant increase in volume. Nothing much happening at altitude. So Jamie hooks up a small chamber to emulate the high pressures of deep sea diving. He didn't figure on explosive results. We had a seal blow. Are you guys all right? <laughs> It sounded like you've shot an elephant. Yeah, it kind of uh, hurt my ears, too. No one hurt, but Jamie had a close call. Rapid changes in pressure can cause serious hearing damage. No changes to the implant at high pressure, so it's back to the large chamber for another low-pressure altitude test. Within a few minutes, it's taken the equivalent of a rapid trip from the ocean's floor to the summit of Everest. So we go up to uh, 30,000 feet? Okay. I don't see nothing. I don't see any air bubbles. I don't see any noticeable difference. So this replicated someone diving in water and then immediately getting into a plane? Yes. So effectively no difference. Scientists at Duke University have been studying the rigors of pressure on the human body for many years. This is the main clinical chamber here. Watch your heads again. And the actual chamber is compressed with air. Dr. Richard Van from Duke University's Center for Hyperbaric Medicine knows all about pressure and the concerns of people with implants. We had several questions that came in with regard to 